Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be at least making the start on my uh, June 2019 uh, reading wrap-up. So basically I'm going to film this in a couple of parts as I did with my last one, because otherwise by the time I've edited it and filmed it and everything it's way too late. So we're going to get started. Okay, so the first book I have to talk about is Bag of Bones by Stephen King. This is basically about a, a novelist called Mike Noonan. His wife has died and he finds himself going back to this sort of summer house that they own together and uh, then he sort of starts communicating with her in a way. Uh, he's had writer's block since her death and finally his writings come back. He's got like sort of fridge magnets that are you know arranging themselves into letters and while all this is going on there's a uh, kind of a court case happening with uh, this old dude called Max DeVore who's trying to get custody of his granddaughter I believe and then the writer befriends the mum of this kid and they decide to take on this old man yeah um, it wasn't very good I gave it a two out of five unfortunately and it's my least favorite Stephen King novel to date and I've read about 40 odd I just think he was kind of trying to be literary horror and it it wasn't literary and it wasn't scary so also I think it could have been a lot shorter so it's 660 pages and I think there was about 200 pages worth of story in this there were some bits where the action kind of kicked in towards the end as well we find out some more about this all, all this old backstory but by this point I didn't care so it then instead of being like this great moment where everything's revealed to you it was just like oh great now there's this massive info dump happening about this thing I don't care about so yeah I don't know I just don't think it was very well executed and I, I wouldn't recommend this one unless you're a Stephen King completionist Next up we have Horns by Joe Hill, who is Stephen King's son as it goes. This is about a guy called Ig who basically wakes up one morning and he has these horns. These horns kind of give him the power to... He can basically kind of sway people a little bit and also they confess all their deepest secrets to him. So for example, a receptionist in the doctor's surgery says to him, God, I'd love to tell the mother of that little brat just to shut him up and get out of here. And, and not. He, he said it a bit nastier than that, but we'll... Uh, We'll try and keep it family friendly because apparently that's what I do now. Um, yeah, the book was pretty good. I think I gave it a 4 out of 5 It's or maybe a 3.75 out of 5 actually. It's not my favourite of the Joe Hill novels that I've read but it was pretty good. My girlfriend also read and enjoyed it and this was her first Joe Hill book. And then we watched the movie and we didn't think much of the movie. Uh, they changed too many things and there are like a lot of layers to this book. Similar to the Bag of Bones, like the Bag of Bones in that. There was lots of different layers, but in Horns, it didn't feel like torture waiting for those layers to be unraveled or whatever, you know? So, um, yeah, it was pretty good. I don't. I think I'd probably still say start with Heart Shaped Box, but um, yeah, Horns is worth reading. The movie, probably, probably skip the movie. And we might be doing a combined book and movie review with uh, me and my girlfriend. We'll see. Okay, next up we have Lynn Truss Talk to the Hand, The Utter Bloody Rudeness of Everyday Life, or Six Good Reasons to Stay Home and Bolt the Door. Now, Lynn Truss wrote Eat, Shoots and Leaves, which is a book about grammar that was quite well received. She also wrote a book called Making the Cat Laugh, which I enjoyed. And so I had kind of high hopes about this, and yeah, I was just very, very disappointed. I mean, it felt as though she was just finding things to complain about. Like, at one point she was complaining about people who have visible tattoos or who talk on their mobile phones in public, or what was the other one? Oh, people who smoke. Just like, yeah, fuck people who smoke. And it's like, well, hang on, because I smoke. <laughs> I am trying to quit again, actually, but, you know. Uh, so, so um, another thing that really annoyed me is she kept saying F off, like spelled E-F-F, -F, and then, yeah, off. Be and actually, that was one of her things. She hates people who swear, and it's like, but you're just... When you're saying F off, it means the exact same thing. It's just pointless censorship. It's like when you put, like, in a song, F, you know, asterisk CK or whatever. Everyone knows that what that means. Why do it? Like, newspapers, it's like, everyone knows what that means. That's exactly the same as just printing the word. It's, it's, uh, anyway. It's kind of ironic that this was just her moaning about things, and now this is just me moaning about the book. But, yeah, two out of five, really didn't enjoy it. And, actually, on Amazon and Goodreads, I am not the only person who didn't enjoy it as well. I think she was trying to do something very different to Eat Shoots and Leaves, and with that she succeeded, but it isn't good. So that kind of, you know, defeats the purpose of it, you know? Whereas then, like, making the cat laugh, that was different, and that was good. So, I don't know, I'll probably give her another 
another try at some point, but I'm not really looking forward to it. Then we have The Terrors of the Night, number 30 by Thomas Nash. Demonic horrors and spirits dreamt up by the most exuberant, inventive prose writer of Elizabethan England. And uh, this wasn't very good. We've not got off to a good start of the month, as you can tell. Basically, the problem here is that he took what could have been a really interesting subject matter and made it super dull, and it just comes across as like the ravings of this mental Elizabeth Elizabethan dude who thinks that there are all these monsters going around. And it's just like, I don't know. It, it was a, to me, it was a bit like, you know, when people start, you see people on YouTube or whatever, like ranting about whatever conspiracy theories they're into. And it was a bit like that. And I'm just like, dude, I, I don't believe in any of this stuff. And also, it's just because it's old English, it's super like difficult to, to read. A man that will entertain them must not pollute his body with any gross carnal copulation or inordinate beastly desires, but love pure beauty, pure virtue, and not have his affections, Lindsay Wolsey, intermingled with lust and things worthy of liking. As for example, if he love good poets, he must not countenance ballad makers. If he have learned physicians, he must not favour horse leeches and mountebanks. For a bad spirit and a good can never endure to dwell together. Two out of five, yeah, I uh, wouldn't recommend it, un unfortunately. Okay, then we have Terry Pratchett, Men at Arms, and I reread this via audiobook. I actually reread it in a single evening, uh, to be fair, at 1.75 times speed. And this was for uh, the Rereadathon 2019 that Alex Black organised, kind of building on from Catalyst Reads one from 2018. Uh, so I can't remember what the prompt was for May, but I had to do some catching up, so I listened to it in June. I did enjoy this book. I mean, it's one of the City Watch books with Commander Sam Vimes in, who's one of my favourite characters, and Ank Morpork is one of my favourite Discworld settings. We also have some new characters coming in, or even older ones being brought into the City Watch. So uh, Detritus, the troll, joins the City Watch. We have Lance Constable Angua, who's a werewolf. Uh, Cuddy, who's a fellow dwarf, along with Captain Carrot, who's not really a dwarf. He was raised by dwarfs. But he thinks he's a dwarf. Uh, the actual central storyline of this didn't grip me as much as I thought it was going to do. But there were a lot of really great character moments that made up for it. And all in all, yeah, it was just a, you know a pleasure to to get back to the Discworld. So I'll probably give it a four out of five. Not quite a five out of five for me. But uh, yeah, I'll be reading more of the Ankh Morpork City Watch books later on this year. All right, then we have my next reread for the Rereadathon. So I picked up The Subtle Knife by Philip Pullman. This is the second book in his his Dark Materials trilogy. I actually reread Northern Lights towards the end of last year, and I'm going to read the uh, the Amber Spyglass later on this year. Again, listen to it via audio, and there were just lots of little details that I'd forgotten, but equally there were loads of things that I'd remembered to like two quite explicit details. Like I remembered that. Uh, basically a character loses a couple of his fingers and I remembered specifically that they were described as lying on the floor like curled up like a pair of bloody quotation marks or something like that and also one of the penultimate lines from just the paragraph before the last paragraph um, I remembered that as well which was kind of cool I, I thought it was strange though because with the audio book you don't see here in the physical book you have like physical icons that show you which world you're in and obviously you hop in between worlds and and it was strange with that in the audiobook because you couldn't necessarily immediately tell what world you were in. But I don't think that was really a problem anyway. And uh, all in all, yeah, really enjoyed the reread of this. And I gave this another 5 out of 5 on, on the reread. Um, yeah, it really held up for me. And I'm really looking forward to the uh, Golden Comfort, the whatever, the Amber Spyglass. Okay, next up we have The Beautiful Cassandra by Jane Austen, Little Black Classic number 33. Austin's riotous early stories of drunks, poisoners, and prison breaks, written for her family's entertainment when she was a teenager. And as you can kind of tell from that description, I don't think this was ever intended from publication. It's very poorly written, uh, not very interesting to me, I'm sure some people would like, but again, it's very poorly written because it's like the equivalent of juvenilia. I don't understand why they picked this instead of some of her later work, even just a sample from one of her novels, because this has kind of put me off Jane Austen now, and it was my first read of her. Um, but I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt because, again, I don't think this was ever meant for public consumption. She couldn't even spell in it. Like, friend would be spelled F-R-E-I-N-D and all this stuff. I mean, beautiful is misspelled on the cover as well. And just, I just, ah, uh, no, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. So, uh, yeah, this was a one out of five. I really hated this, <laughs> basically. Um, but I will give Jane Austen another go. And I do actually have a really beautiful looking copy of Persuasion, which I'm going to try. Uh, and also this was my final book for the Little Black Classic, so there are no more of these for me to read now as well. Then we have A Whiff of Death by Isaac Asimov, and I just got this from a charity shop because I'm slowly working my way through Asimov. Didn't realise this was a mystery novel, but I was pleasantly surprised when I discovered that. It turns out that Asimov's pretty good at writing mystery novels. 
And uh, I mean, I I love sort of Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie, that kind of stuff. It's in, in a similar vein. It's set in an uh, American college. Basically, follows this uh, professor who's trying to get tenure, and then one of his students dies, and he realizes he's potentially the main suspect. I thought it was very cleverly written, and despite me not knowing too much about that kind of academic setting, I was really drawn into it. Really interested. Kept on guessing up until the end. Didn't get who the murderer was as well. And I like the fact that. Asimov tapped into his knowledge of science to create the story, you know, as well. So I would say if you're interested in mysteries, check this out. If you're interested in Asimov and you've never really read mysteries, also check this out. And I gave this a solid 4.5 out of 5. And the last book I have to talk to you about today is The Ladybird Book of Mindfulness by J.A. Hazley and J.C. Morris. I've basically just been working my way through these as and when I see them in charity shops. They're kind of fun little books that are Ladybird books for adults. Uh, so Ladybird used to make books for kids and these are the adult equivalents. So for example, here we have Clive likes to practice loving kindness meditation. This is when someone thinks of a friend then sends them love. Clive finds this easier than bothering to meet his friends or lending them money. One other one, uh, you can achieve mindfulness anywhere simply by filling your mind with images of calm, serenity or wonder. By practicing mindfulness, Martin has found inner peace, even though he is being kidnapped by swans. So yeah, I gave this a 4 out of 5. I particularly enjoyed it because as a mental health issue sufferer, I guess if you want to call it that, I've kind of been told to try mindfulness quite often uh, with varying results, but I like the fact that this pokes fun at it while simultaneously being fairly respectful of it as well. So yeah, that's where I'm at so far, and I'll hand you over to Future Dane, who's going to tell you about some more of the books that I, he slash I have read this month. All right. All right, it's me again, and I have some more books to update you on. So, where did we get up to last time? Up next, we have Nightmares and Dreamscapes by Stephen King. This is a collection of, what, 14, 16 short stories? Actually, maybe 20. They've got quite a few on there. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, this is a book that was picked by my cat for my Cat Picks My TBR video, by the way, so I'll link to that below. Uh, some of the standout stories in this for me were Dolan's Cadillac, which is basically like a super ambitious revenge story where someone tries to basically build a pit trap in the middle of a road to bury someone alive in their car. Very Stephen King. Uh, the Night Flyer was good as well. That was a vampire story. Uh, the Moving Finger was weird, very like Lovecraftian about like a finger coming out through somebody's uh, sink in their bathroom. And they basically start to lose their mind a bit and wage all out war on this thing. Uh, you know they got a hell of a band, that's quite Twilight zone -y. This couple finds themselves in a town called Rock and Roll Heaven and like they're served by like Buddy Holly and stuff and basically the town wants them to not get out and they meet the mayor. So uh, say hi to the mayor to for me if you, if you read that one. A couple of other ones I didn't like so much. I didn't like Head Down which was an essay about uh, Little League Baseball just because I don't really do sports. Uh, and I don't really do baseball even if I do do sports and the doctor's case just felt a bit weird in this uh, it was basically King trying to write like Raymond Chandler as though Chandler was writing a Sherlock Holmes novel or short story rather but it was quite cool in that it was Watson who solved the case all in all pretty good collection of uh, short stories some I liked some I didn't like so much but you always get that with short stories and it was a uh, four out of five for me Okay, then we have Willis Hall, The Vampire's Revenge. I'm going to read the blurb of this one, I think. Count Alucard, the veggie vampire, is on the run again. But this time he knows just where to go. America, the land of opportunity. A place where a man can be judged for what he is and not for his ancestors' hideous historical shenanigans. But fate intervenes in the shape of a Hollywood producer and the hapless Count soon finds himself starring in his very own blockbuster adventure spanning the length and breadth of the good old US of A. Lights, camera, action. And I just used to really like this series as a kid. I haven't actually read this one before but I saw it going cheap in a charity shop so I thought I'd pick it up. And actually I gave it a four out of five and I thought I got the nostalgia that I wanted from it but actually it was quite a well-written short story uh, well I guess you'd call it what like a children's novel you know and um, there was just lots in there that I really enjoyed lots to make me laugh and I like the fact that he's vegetarian as well although these days I think he should be vegan okay then we have Last Human by Doug Naylor so Doug Naylor is one half of Grant Naylor who are the writing duo behind Red Dwarf the TV show and uh, this is one of the novels now what I didn't like about this for a start I think Rob Grant and Doug Naylor work better when they write together as opposed to when they write individually but also this book and to be fair the other books in this series they steal so heavily from the show that sometimes it's like self plagiarism so they'll use jokes that they've used in the show and then it would wind me up because I'm like well but the show is canon but this is also canon but you have the same 
like conversation happening but in two totally different scenarios at times like different people delivering punchlines and stuff so that really did wind me up a bit but having said that it was also quite nice to go back to the red dwarf characters i mean i love that show i was kind of raised on it and uh yeah i think this is the only one of the red dwarf novels i hadn't read so now i've done them all probably won't reread but yeah it was like a three out of five Okay, then we have If You Liked School, You'll Love Work by Irvin Welsh. This has got five short stories. The main two I want to talk about, the first one is called Rattlesnakes. And this is about basically some kids are on their way home from like a music festival and their car breaks down in the desert. They kind of camp alongside the road. And then one of them is bitten on the penis by a rattlesnake. And then another one has to try and suck the poison out. And then these gun-wielding Mexican thugs show up and weird things happen from there. Uh, as if that wasn't weird enough. And the other is called Kingdom of Fife, and it's basically your quite typical Irvin Welsh story. And it follows like a like five foot two ex jockey who's a bit of a Jack the Lad, and then like a middle class horse riding girl, and their like unlikely romance. There's also a scene where somebody dies in a motorcycle accident and his uh, head's taken off by a, a sign that says like speed kills, I think it says. So yeah, really enjoyed it. I gave it a 4 out of 5. I actually read this like 25 pages at a time before bed because it's one of those things, especially with Welsh, where you can have too much of a good thing, you know, and it's quite heavy going. And so by reading only a bit of it at a time, I think I increased my enjoyment. Okay, then we have We Were Liars by E. Lockhart. This is like a, I guess it's a YA romance. I don't know, I thought it was more of a thriller, more in the vein of like Gone Girl, but it isn't really. It's definitely a romance for the first half and then there are just some like twists at the end, I guess. Uh, we are liars, we are beautiful and privileged, we are cracked and broken, a tale of love and romance, a tale of tragedy. Which are lies, which is truth, you decide. Now, I just didn't really enjoy this. The writing style was kind of okay, but then there were bits where, and there's an example right at the start, where like she'd stretch a sentence over paragraphs for no reason like here I don't know if you can see that and then uh, also there were these like fairy tale bits where it was kind of like a metaphor for what was going on in the story and I guess presented as though the character herself was writing them but they just felt a bit like filler to be honest as well as like bits like this where you have you had like multiple parts in it and it's only a couple of hundred pages so I think without all that stuff it would have only been like 150 pages maybe and I think it would have actually been a tighter book because of that I also didn't like the twist at the end and the whole sort of gimmick of this this character losing her memory which is kind of vital to the plot uh, it, it was on par for a 3 out of 5 and then I didn't like the twist at the end so it went down to a 2 out of 5 so yeah then we have Francesco Marculiano. I could pee on this and other poems by cats. I'll just read you a couple so you can get a feel for them. The leash. Don't put that thing around my neck. Don't take me out the front door. Don't show me off in the park. Don't drag me into every store. Don't smile when people stop and stare. Don't sit outside and talk on the phone. Don't walk me all over this damn town then wonder why you're still alone. I'll do this one as well. Nudge. Nudge. Nudge, nudge, nudge. Nudge, 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 nudge. Your glass just shattered on the floor. I'll do one more. This is on the theme of existence. I'm not paranoid. I'm not touching my food because there's a pill in it. I'm not having that treat because there's a pill in it. I'm not going near your hand because there's a pill in it. I'm not playing with that toy because there's a pill in it. I'm not going into that room because there's a pill in it. I'm not sleeping on that couch because there's a pill in it. I'm not looking at the sky because there's a pill up there. I'm not doing anything because there's a pill everywhere. You may think I'm paranoid, you may think I'm rather nuts, but you're not going to fool me twice. And besides, I think I can cure hookworm with my mind. So yeah, pretty gimmicky book, but fun for what it is. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. I think if you like poetry or cats, you'll probably like this. And it's quite a good little gift book as well for like birthdays and secret santas and stuff okay and then next up we have these two which are lock and key volume one welcome to lovecraft and lock and key volume two head games by joe hill and gabriel rodriguez i'm gonna give both of these a pretty solid four out of five so far and basically it's kind of hard to explain it's very joe hill though and you know by extension quite stephen kingy uh quite brutal for a graphic novel quite violent at times and basically we're following this family who like a tragedy has happened and they relocate to this town called Lovecraft and they live in a mansion called, what is it called, Lock Mansion? The Lock Family Mansion? I don't know, I can't remember. And uh, they have all these keys that can do different things so you can kind of open portals or you can kind of like astrally project yourself or you can like 
unlock your own head and like change your memories and like you could put like an encyclopedia in your head and you'd know it all off by heart and stuff. So it's very quirky and uh, yeah, definitely enjoying them so far. But I can't crack on with number three yet because that's at my girlfriend's house because she's reading it and she's ahead of me. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Have I got some books for you? Yes. Yes, I have. So... <laughs> Here is Alien by Alan Dean Foster. I picked this up for my, my Cat Picks My TBR videos. It's the novelization based on the movie. Alan Dean Foster previously wrote Midworld, which is one of Todd the Librarian's favorite books. And I actually picked it up because of him and it was excellent. This was also very good. I think one of the things I really liked about this was that uh, Foster's like, he's obviously watched the movie and read the scripts and whatnot as the research, but he's also done his own thinking. So for example, the iconic scene where the uh, alien bursts out of the person's chest. In the book, he's sort of talking about the stench of it because it's kind of ate its way through the guts and so it smells like, you know, human excrement. And I just thought that was really interesting because obviously in a movie, you can't smell it. So it's all visual there, you know? Uh, I also thought it was weird because I watched the movie after reading this and for a start, I'd forgotten that one of the characters turns out to be a robot. And then Beck spoiled it for me. She was like, has the robot, like, have they got the robot yet? And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. So thanks, Bex, if you're watching, for spoiling me on, <laughs> on Alien. <laughs> even though I'd already seen it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then also there were, one of the characters was black. And it just totally didn't come across in the book. But I kind of think that's a good thing because... It doesn't really matter what race the characters are in the book, you know. So, um, yeah, all in all, really good read. 4.25 out of 5 and would recommend. Then we have Lock and Key Volume 3 by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. This is Crown of Shadows. Obviously the third one here. I can't say too much about the storyline because I don't want to kind of ruin it for everyone. But basically it, f it follows this sort of magical mansion in which there are all these keys that do different things. And in this one we get like this kind of the well the, the literal the crown of shadows and if you have that it gives you the key to all of the shadows in the house and they come and try and you know get you if if the bad guy has has the crown of shadows which spoiler alert they do uh, this also had a really interesting ending i thought as well so i'm looking forward to the next one although beck says it isn't as good but um she also says that like each story in that one is a different key, which I think is quite cool. Might keep, get the pacing going, but uh, overall still a four out of five. Okay, then we have a Charles Dickens anthology edited by Kathleen Wood. And uh, this was like specially commissioned by Rothman's, the cigarette brand, which I used to smoke back in the day as well. But I basically picked this up because I saw it in a charity shop and I thought it was super cool. And it's just like a collection of different extracts of Dickens's books. Like, mostly the popular ones like Oliver Twist, David Copperfield. I think the Pickwick Papers is in here quite a bit as well. But there are occasional kind of more obscure ones as well. And they're all kind of grouped around different themes. So one of the most interesting themes, for example, was on the theme of London at the time. And uh, yeah, if you can get a copy of this, I would recommend it. I gave it like, probably like a four out of five, and I'm looking forward to reading more Dickens. Then we have Agatha Christie, Hercule Poirot's Christmas. I guess I'll read you the blurb of this one. Christmas Eve, a time for good cheer, eating, drinking, and overindulgence. An opportunity to bring together families who have grown apart. The Lee family reunion is shattered by a deafening crash of furniture and a blood-curdling scream. The wow, bit my tongue. The tyrannical Simeon Lee is found dead in a pool of his own blood, his throat slashed. Despite the festivities, it seems that everyone in the family hated the old man, one of them enough to kill him. So because of that setup, really it's quite a typical Agatha Christie book. There wasn't too much to like mark it apart for me. It does take place over Christmas, and obviously I was reading this in the middle of June, but I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I think Christmas is very much just the backdrop, and I've heard like the same is true of like uh, the Halloween party, that you don't need to read at Halloween to get the full enjoyment, you know? And it was a pretty decent murder mystery. It's just, I feel as though... It's just retreading old ground here. Now, I've kind of read the Christie novels out of order as well. So perhaps this was slightly earlier. I, I don't know. I don't have the list in front of me when they were all published. But, um, yeah, it just felt very average. So I gave it a pretty average 3.5 out of 5. Then we have The Sun and Her Flowers by Rupi Kaur. Now, this one's an interesting one because... Basically, because this is a popular book on BookTube, I automatically assumed I probably wouldn't like it because it, they tend to be overhyped, let's be honest. And... Uh, also, I've heard like I've heard it disparagingly referred to as like an Instagram poet. I've heard that like her poems can get quite repetitive, especially because they're quite often about like love and heartbreak, which I think are fair enough comments. But I don't think 
there's necessarily a problem with that. Like, I don't have prob any problem with someone being an Instagram poet. I think people say that, like, her work's too simplistic. And I like simple poetry. So, um, I actually quite enjoyed it. I'm going to read you a couple out at random. And, and you know, maybe maybe that will change your mind if you're one of those Rupi Kaur haters. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I loved it. What I did think I put in my book blog was that it reminded me a bit of feminist Charles Bukowski. And I think both Rupi Kaur and Charles Bukowski would both hate that comparison. Which makes me want to use it all of the time. Because um, it's got that same kind of simplicity. She can build a picture really easily with just a few words, you know. That one looked like a promising one. Rise, said the moon, and the new day came. The show must go on, said the sun. Life does not stop for anybody. It drags you by the legs whether you want to move forward or not. That is the gift. Life will force you to forget how you long for them. Your skin will shed till there is not a single part of you left they've touched. Your eyes, finally just your eyes, not the eyes which held them. You will make it to the end of what is only the beginning. Go on, open the door to the rest of it. This is called addiction. Oh, there's also these uh, illustrations in it, which I wasn't a big fan of, which I think is kind of ironic, because by the sounds of it, I think she started drawing before she wrote poetry, but I suppose most people do actually, you know. I tried to leave many times, but as soon as I got away, my lungs buckled under the pressure, panting for air I'd return. Perhaps this is why I let you skin me to the bone. Something was better than nothing. Having you touch me, even if it was not kind, was better than not having your hands at all. I could take the abuse, I could not take the absence. I knew I was beating a dead thing, but did it matter if the thing was dead, when at the very least I had it? So yeah, I, I thought it was alright. I gave it like a 3.5, maybe a 3.75 out of 5, I don't know. And I would read some of her stuff again. Then I read The Children of Little Thwapping by Ollie Jacobs. This is for Tarden Danes, indie read-along. And this is basically a sort of dark oh, comedy horror take on like John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids almost. Basically it's set in like the 1950s in this like British... Uh, village, I guess, uh, and uh, basically all all of the people, all the women get pregnant at the same time, and they all give birth to these like weird alien babies with like massive limbs who can fire laser beams out of their eyes. And uh, yeah, this kind of follows what happens there. Now, I don't know whether everybody would like this because there's like lots of like casual misogyny for the purposes of humour, but it is humorous if that makes sense like it doesn't come across as genuinely misogynistic one of the main characters was talking about like going home and making love to his wife until the tears stopped or something and like all this stuff because they're meant to be these really insensitive bastard husbands who are all you know they're all drinking they're all sleeping with each other's wives and uh yeah but i, I did enjoy it i'm gonna read you a random bit out i guess so let's see what we got here you have yori the russian there randy dan I like this point, actually. This bit made me laugh. So this is when uh, they go to see Dr. Mandrake. But it was Bob who spoke the loudest by saying nothing much at all. When his moment came, we had all expressed our exasperation at Dr. Mandrake's bemusement at our stories. In fact, it wasn't until Bob's words burst forth from his mouth that the doctor seemed to take any form of interest in what we were trying to say. My child has grown to a length of five feet, Bob said. He didn't elaborate on this, nor did he say anything further, instead letting the words sink into the air in the Doctor's brain. Uh, yeah, I'd give this like a 3.75 out of 5, and there'll be more on this in my like indie read-along update. Okay, then we have William Shakespeare's Star Wars, Verily, A New Hope by Ian Dersher. This is basically a star, like a Shakespearean take on Star Wars. But what's really well done is like the author clearly not only is a massive Star Wars fan, but he knows his Shakespeare. So there are lots of little references like right at the start, actually, C-3PO gets the opening line uh, in the movie. The opening line is, did you hear that? Fun fact. So uh, C-3PO's opening line here is, now is the summer of our happiness. Obviously, like, now is the summer of our discontent. So he goes, Now is the summer of our happiness, made winter by this sudden fierce attack. Our ship is under siege, I know not how. Oh, hast thou heard? The main reactor fails. We shall most surely be destroyed by this. Our warrant madness lies herein. And then R2-D2 goes, Beep, 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 meep, squeak, beep, 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 wee. And it's all written in iambic pentameter as well, which is even more cool. And it's like literally the length of a typical Shakespeare play. There's a little bit on that at the end. So now I want to read the rest of these ones. And I think he's also done uh, Much Ado About Mean Girls. And uh, he's also done uh, a Back to the Future one as well. So yeah, 4.5 out of 5 for this. Excellent. And finally here, for today at least, we have Hickory Dickory Dock by Agatha Christie. So I'll read you the blurb. 
Hercule Poirot doesn't need all his detective skills to realise something is troubling his secretary, Miss Lemon. She has made three mistakes in a single letter. It seems an outbreak of kleptomania at the student hostel in which her sister works is distracting his usually efficient assistant. Deciding that desperate times call for desperate measures, the great detective agrees to investigate. Unknown to Poirot, however, desperation is a motive he shares with a killer. And this is just pretty fun. It's sort of... It was written during the 1950s, but I think Christie's kind of back to her best with this, to be honest. I thought the characters were great and so was the location, this hostel. They all kind of really came alive. I read this in about a day as well. And it's just rare for one of Christie's books for all of the characters and the location to really just come alive in my head. It's usually one or the other. Uh, there was also like drug smuggling and like an alcoholic in there. Lots of twists and turns. Not too much Poirot, which is good because I'm not a particular Poirot fan. And it was just excellent. It was just what the doctor ordered. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. Alright, I'm going to stop for a bit because I'm losing my voice. And also, I've got no more books to update you on. But soon. Well, alrighty. It is now the 3rd of July. And so I can finish my wrap-up. So I have four more books to talk to you about. So I read Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. And this is kind of like a sci-fi thriller like psychological thriller I guess but it also deals with like the many universes paradox the idea uh, similar with Schrodinger's cat when you put Schrodinger's cat into a box with a decaying uh, radioactive element there's you know you never know whether the element has decayed or not and the only way you can find out is to specifically observe it but observing it causes it to change so the idea of Schrodinger's cat being in a box you never know whether it's dead or alive and in a weird way in a like a quantum way it's technically both and so there's that and the idea of the, the butterfly effect where each little tiny decision somebody makes it all has like these bigger effects and whatnot. So I said in my uh, re review on my vlog, there's one universe where right now I decided to go and there's another universe where I decided to go and so now <laughs> there are like infinite other universes that have just sprung into existence where I decided to do something different or in fact didn't decide to do that at all. It's all like crazy once you start to think about it because there are just infinite universes basically. And in this, I don't want to give away too much about what happens because it really is the kind of book you should go into blind but it basically deals with the consequences of that in quite an interesting way that starts to get meta as well. And it was just very well written, a great sort of, like I say, like a sort of a psychological thriller but like also sci-fi and also I don't know almost like a, almost like an action movie like the an action movie equivalent of a book an action novel you know so while this does have some sort of similarities to writers like Gillian Flynn and that sort of thing it's not really a thriller in the same sense I wouldn't say this is more for uh, I don't know if you're into sci-fi little bits of horror and uh, that kind of stuff yeah I really enjoyed it I get this a four out of five I swear, all I'm trying to do is film four more books, and there's traffic everywhere, and weird noises, and all this stuff. Okay, then I read This Abstract Mental Thing by Ryan A. Loera. So Ryan is Madman Reads and Rocks here on Booktube. I recommend you check out his channel. This is basically three poetry collections in one. In fact, I'll read you the blurb. This Abstract Mental Thing is actually three original poetry collections in one. The first is titled This Thing We Call Life, and is a collection of 30 poems. The second is titled Mental Forms and is a collection of 40 poems. The third and final collection is titled Abstractness and is a collection of 44 poems. All poems are original creations and were created with one goal in mind, to challenge both the reader and the writer. Please pause for a few seconds slash minutes after reading each poem and reflect on whatever it reminds you of or doesn't remind you of. Now what's cool is these are all like literally page length as well. It's all kind of free verse, fairly experimental stuff, so it's probably not for everybody but personally for me. It's exactly the kind of poetry that I like to read. So I'm going to read you a poem from each of those three sections. So here is Tree Demons. And this is from This Thing We Call Life. Evil tree demons tell her to do idiotic things, such as start a pillow fight with a deranged gorilla, or play hide and seek in a nuclear power plant. Boy, I tell you, those tree demons are pretty clever. They even told her to vacuum her apartment, then set it on fire. That's clever. I wish I knew a tree demon. Oh wait, I think I do. No, I don't. Okay, this is from Mental Forms. We'll do Rotting Tomato. In Mexico, somewhere, a girl ate her own heart. She assumed it would taste like chicken. It was actually more akin to a rotting tomato. Her relatives did not mourn her, for they too wondered what their hearts would taste like. And the final bit from, uh, from Abstractness. 
We'll go with ovens. Jetsam, Jingo, Jokund, Why, Animal, Lie, Impartial, Unprejudiced, Sloppy, Bite, Dictionary, Dreams, Threadbare, Injure, Buttocks, Indiscreet, Artless, Spirit, Snaffle. How much room was there in Tuscany? Witnessed an oryx, oscillate out back, clandestine surprises convene in ovens, in ovens. So yeah, I thought this was pretty cool. I gave it like probably a 3.75, maybe a 4 out of 5 at a push. And uh, yeah, I mean, again, this is not poetry for everybody, but if it sounds like the kind of thing from what I've just read aloud to you, definitely check it out. And uh, you can also check out Ryan's channel, uh, like I say, Madman Reads and Rocks, and there you can get some like samples of his poems too, so... You'll be able to find out there whether you like them or not. And that brings me to my final two of the month. So here we have Lock and Key Volume 4, Keys to the Kingdom by Joe Hill, Gabriel Rodriguez. This was 3.75 out of 5. And then we have Lock and Key Clockworks Volume 5 by Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. And this was a 3.5 out of 5. Now the reason being... I think for volume five, my uh, my other half's actually been reading these ahead of me and she really enjoyed it and she said one of the reasons she liked volume five was that it goes into the past a lot and we see a lot of the, you know, key house during the time of like the American Revolution. Um, but I don't know, for me, that the entire issue of issue five just felt like set up and build up for issue six, which I guess that makes sense because it's the last issue, the next one that I've got to read. So you can kind of f forgive it for that, but... It just didn't hold my attention in the way that the other ones did. Four was a little bit better. Uh, four, the main thing in this that was a bit different is that there were just keys galore, so it was hard to keep track of it. So in the first few, basically the premise of this book is you've got these keys that have magical properties. So perhaps you can open up your head and you can put a dictionary inside your head and suddenly you know all of the words. Or perhaps you can you know, go outside of your own body like a ghost or you can see what's happening somewhere else. And sort of in the first three volumes, they kind of illicit, it, 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 they it, there was mainly one key per volume, you know, and then maybe there were two or three, but there was like one main key, and so it was quite easy to follow. And then suddenly in volume four, we get about six new keys, and I had no idea what was happening. And then in volume five, suddenly we're in the past. So I mean, all the world building and stuff's do like well done. It's you know, it's well written and well illustrated. I just don't think that these two volumes were quite as good as the first three. But I do like how Volume 5 ended and I'm looking forward to Volume 6 and, you know, finishing it off and seeing whether there's a big finale. So there we have it. Those are all of the books that I read in June. It was a bit of a, a, a smaller month for me, I guess, because I, I only read 29 books. But I did also just finish two big books at the end of the month. Like, I finished them on July the 1st, and also, like, a couple of Stephen Kings and stuff like that. And I finished the Penguin Little Black Classics now as well. Wrap-up video of that coming soon. I haven't forgotten. It's filmed. I just haven't edited it. Like, I haven't edited most of the things that I've filmed. But, yeah, all in all, pretty good month, and I'm looking forward to July. So, on that note, thanks, as always, for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.